So I was prompted to do this because I found my 1975 holiday diary, um, which was a, a, a project when I was a schoolboy and I was 12 years old. So here's the cover of it. And I rather like that. I do like that, that bit of graphic design on the cover. I think that's rather smart. Um, and, and here we go, age 12 years and two months. Yes, he makes his holiday diary. What a pretentious little child I clearly was. Um, but anyway, in the holiday diary, there's all sorts of tickets for museums. And here's one for the Musée Fragonard, which I don't think I actually went to. I think that probably my dad slipped off there and then he gave me the ticket to stick in my diary. Um, but I did go to the Villa Kerilos, which we used to call the Villa Grec. I mean, my only excuse for the, the terrible drawing is the fact that I was 12 years old. So I suppose it's all right for a 12 year old. But also down the bottom is, is the ticket to get into the villa and the Fondation Theodor Reinach. And the price was three French francs. Here is Theodor Reinach who built the villa. Although the grandfather maybe had been a, a banker, you know, financing Napoleonic wars, that kind of thing. Made a colossal fortune. They built railways and all that kind of thing. And so this generation of Theodore, Salomon, and Joseph, I think, were all were all able to to spend the money really um, and live very nicely. And here's Fanny Reinach, who was Theodore's second wife. And anyway, the two of them decided to build this villa. They met this young architect called Emmanuel Pontremoli, and that's him on the left there with the stick and the rather dapper moustache. Um, and, and he's there studying in Greece, I think, doing a bit of archaeology. Pontremoli was the grandson of the rabbi of Nice, and so was a, a local boy. They bought this bit of land that here you can see it in 1895 or something. So this is Beaulieu-sur-Mer. So it's just between what, Villefranche and Monaco, Monte Carlo. And so at this point, there's, I suppose, a grand hotel in Beaulieu-sur-Mer on the left. And then this spit of land going out into the sea with nothing but pine trees on it. And so they bought that. Another postcard, this is while the house is in construction. And you can see sort of scaffolding and the house going up on the end of the point there. This is the only picture I'll show you of the outside of the house, apart from my terrible incredible position so I mean such a beautiful spot the whole house is conceived as an ancient Greek villa built sort of 1902 to 1908 it's not really very like real ancient Greek villas I believe because I, I don't think they had mosaic floors I think most of actual houses in ancient Greece had actually quite uneven clay floors I believe which is why they had three-legged tables and chairs with flexible legs mosaics in houses are a Roman thing. But anyway, the house is absolutely full of these very beautiful mosaic floors. But here's the sort of entrance hall. And then most of my photographs really show details of the furniture. It's a curious perspective, maybe, but a convenient one if you want to really study the construction of these um, wonderful chairs. And so most of the chairs in the house are uh, you know, adapted from um, designs of, of ancient Greek klismos chairs. And, and these were the, the, the sort of easy chair of ancient Greece. You know, and they did have these flexible, slightly flexible legs. And, and then these three-legged tables. Here's one of these three-legged tables. I think really Salomon Reinach, um, the, the brother of Theodore who built the house, um, was also an archeologist and a historian. He, I think, sponsored the purchase or somehow facilitated the purchase by the Louvre of a fake tiara that was supposed to be an ancient Scythian, you know, sort of ancient Greek gold tiara. This object was bought by the Louvre for 200,000 francs in 1896. Tremendous fanfare and put in the Galerie d'Apollon and all of Paris went to see it. And then it was announced to be a fake. And the man who had made it, who was a, a Jewish craftsman in Odessa, um, hears about this and goes to the Louvre and does a demonstration of how he made it. And so there was a huge scandal. And of course, it was at the time of the whole kind of Dreyfus affair. And so there was anyway, all of this terrible stuff going on in Paris, rabid anti-Semitism. Theodore and Fanny died in the late 20s. Um, but the, the son, Léon, um, who was married to Miss Efrusi. They and their children were, were, I'm afraid, taken to Auschwitz and murdered there. But here, let's get back to the beautiful furniture. 
but here's a wonderful um, pair of sort of cabinets. And all this furniture was made by the most expensive, the most sophisticated um, joiners in Paris. This, you know, nail decorated ancient Greek chest. Um, and it is so beautiful. Look at that detail, isn't that fantastic? And of course the nails are all absolutely perfect. Bronze nails, and, and I mean, there are about 10 different sizes used, aren't there? And nail decoration is a fantastic way of, you know, using a, a very cheap, cheap, simple technique and cheap, simple ingredients to make something look great. But here, of course, they've gone the other way and made, used the most expensive possible technique of nail decorating. But it is a beautiful result. But I do love the detail of of all of this. And here's a detail of a cabinet. Look at the carving on that sort of capital detail. Isn't that fantastic? Of course, no wooden furniture survives from ancient Greece. Wooden furniture survives from Egypt um, because it was, you know, buried in the sand and, and the dry atmosphere preserved it. But all Greek um, wooden things disappeared, really. And then here we have um, a detail, I mean a ridiculously detailed detail of one of the curtains and so all of the fabrics were done with this rather coarse embroidery on linen and they've all faded to these um, various tones of beige and what the colours were originally, I don't know, maybe they were all beige, who knows. And then here we have the inlaid marble walls of the great sort of reception room um, and again, this is this is not something that would have happened ever in, a, in, a, in an ancient Greek house, I believe. I think inlaid marble walls would only possibly have happened. Um, I mean, I don't think they'd have happened anywhere, really, realistically. Um, I think everything was painted. But, you know, if there were inlaid marble walls, it would only have been in a religious building, I think. And, and that chair there, of course, is a throne. So that's not a klismos, that's a thronos. Um, straight legs and I suppose these marble sort of shelves had displays of objects once upon a time. It's wonderful beamed wooden ceiling with stencil decoration on it and here are a, a, another design of Klismoy and says so all sorts of different different interpretations of Klismoy's chairs that Pontremoli made and so Klismoy's now are always reproduced with a very deep curved back that wraps around and holds you in the chair, which is absolutely not a Greek thing. That was actually a, a Roman innovation, and so they're completely inaccurate. And they started in, in, in the 18th century. Um, people really, you know, got to Rome more easily than Greece, obviously, and so they saw that the, the, there are some sort of Roman theatre seats somewhere that have this, they're actually marble, that they reproduced these very deep curved backs. And so people think that Klismos had that, but they did not originally. Here's another of those wonderful mosaic floors. And here's the first room with these um, embroidered linen wall hangings, which I think are absolutely wonderful. And they hang from little tiny bronze hooks. But they are normally shown on, on old you know, Greek pots and things with cushions. Um, and they normally do have cushions, not only cushions, but footstools also. Usually there's a footstool. And the Rhinax clearly didn't feel in the mood for footstools. Here's another detail of one of the wall hangings. And here's an open window. And I can almost feel the soft Mediterranean breeze blowing in through there. And it is an absolute delight to visit this house. So if you're ever in the south of France and you haven't been, go because it is wonderful. And, and usually, I mean, anyway, any time I went, it was normally empty because, of course, people want to be on the beach or looking for movie stars or something. And they're not really that interested in seeing a curious 1900 ancient Greek villa and a wonderful cabinet behind. And here's a detail of that with more ivory inlay. And this is an ancient Greek upright piano. Um, and you might be surprised to hear that they had pianos in ancient Greece. And indeed, obviously, they did not, um, because pianos were invented, weren't they, in the sort of, um, they invented late 18th century. Anyway, so, you, but you can just about see the keyboard um, behind the inset face of me droning on about things. And then it's open, and you can see some of the strings inside. And then this is another room with, with walls painted, this wonderful deep terracotta colour on with this 
huge palmette design. And that, that, I think that's a fantastic piece of design, that very bold pattern. And then here, another, I think, rather invented chair with turned legs. And here, a, a, a klismos with the back legs ending at the seat, which again is not a thing that happened in antiquity. Isn't that beautiful? Those lines are just wonderful, aren't they? And I'm obsessed with Klismos Church because I made some of my own many years ago. And here's, I think, is this Athena? Not sure. Um, in bronze. Those are the, the treads of the staircase on the left marble staircase. And um, and these nice bronze grills. Obviously the Rhinax weren't going to eat with their hands. And so they had ancient Greek cutlery made in silver. And isn't it wonderful? And that's obviously an ancient Greek placemat. But there's this new book which is a sort of a novel, but, you know, a novel based on the true story of, of the Rhinax um, and, and the house. And it's called Villa of Delirium, written by Adrian Goetz, and it's coming out today or something. They sent me an email about it, looking through into yet another room, another wonderful floor, and, and here's another fantastic but completely invented chair. So this, I suppose, is a bedroom, you see. It doesn't look frightfully comfortable, does it? But I suspect there was a mattress once upon a time. The bathroom, completely inappropriate, with a sort of Roman-style marble bath. And then and then I like, don't you, the, the, not only the taps for running water, hot and cold, but also the soap dish. So, you know, those ancient Greeks, they did live well. Um, and here are the taps, and aren't they beautiful? And they've got sort of dolphins, spouts, and then swans, and there's ancient Greeks and they're showering. Isn't that a marvellous shower? And it's a real sort of, you know, 1905 shower with full body jet and all these kinds of things. And then, of course, all the instructions are written in Greek. <laughs> so presumably, you know, house guests would have to be similarly obsessed. I think this is the master bedroom. And this is rather wonderful because it's got these sort of end bays of the room screened by these columns and then and curtains that you can pull back um, for, for modesty. And, uh, and the end bays have these sort of indigo painted walls um, with patterns and designs painted on them. And I think it's a rather fantastic look, isn't that marvellous? Um, and there's another uh, Pontremoli's Clismos interpretations. But aren't those indigo walls wonderful? And then here, the bed linen and, and a linen hanging um, on, on the wall by the bed. And the whole thing seems slightly better days. And I wonder what the colours were originally. I mean, they probably were all just this, this sort of colour, but it is looking slightly ragged now. And this is 20 years ago, probably. This, I think, is the, is the sort of dining, dining area um, with couches for dining on, of course, and, and rather insufficient cushions. Um, they would have had rather bigger cushions in reality. And that's just a rather nicely painted cupboard in the hall or somewhere. And then here we're outside, and that's just a, a bench looking at um, the Mediterranean through some railings. So that's all the pictures I've got of, of uh, Villa Kerilos. Um, and, and that's our last stop in France. Now we're going to go, we're actually going to, I, I was going to go to Italy, but then I thought, actually, um, let's look at something else inspired by ancient Greece. 